Well, thank you for that. And um, our church just, uh, our elders, we just recently uh, voted to join Pillar. So that was, that was yeah, we're, we're very excited about the Pillar Network and what, what they're doing. And um, let's pray again. Father, we ask, especially after lunch, we pray for strength and for attention. Lord, uh, energize us, help us, even though uh, the flesh is weak. We pray you'd make our spirits willing and open by your spirit to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, the New Covenant, I want to talk about the New Covenant a little bit and then talk about the law. The New Covenant is the fulfillment, I think, of all the other covenants. That There's different terminology used for the New Covenant. Of course, it is called the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31. But it's also called the Covenant of Peace. And uh, we see that. Don't try to keep up with me on this, but because I'm going to go fast. Isaiah 54, 10, Ezekiel 34, 25, Ezekiel 37, 26. It's also called the everlasting covenant in Isaiah 55, 3, 61, 8, Jeremiah 32, 40, 55, Ezekiel 16, 60, 37, 26. Well, you can all look that up later. I just want you to know that, you know, th these terms are found in a number of places. I think there's two texts we should read. First one, Jeremiah 31, and then Ezekiel 36. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So clear contrast with the Old Covenant when Israel was delivered from Egyptian slavery. My covenant that they broke, even though I am their master. So we already saw that's the main problem with the Old Covenant, right? Why did they go into exile? They didn't keep the stipulations, the commands of that covenant. They broke the covenant. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching or my law, Torah, within them and write it on their hearts. So that fixes the problem with the old covenant. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the typical covenant formula. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. I'll say more about that shortly. This is the Lord's declaration, for I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. Of course, Hebrews really plays off that last line. The definitive, final, complete forgiveness is achieved in the new covenant. And that forgiveness was not achieved with the Old Testament sacrifices, even the Day of Atonement. Then Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So that's Israel's problem, right? Hearts of stone. What was Israel's problem? They were unregenerate. Of course, it's our problem too. Before we meet Christ, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes, and carefully observe my ordinances. So the problem, the fundamental problem is disobedience. The solution is God gives his spirit and enables his people to keep his law. So really, I'm going to talk about the law as well. Both of these are belong together. So we have a promise of a new covenant. Also, we have a promise of a new David. Right, we, we really saw that last time because the new covenant fulfills all the other covenants. So we really, I don't really need to return to what I was talking about. We have that covenant with David. There'd be an eternal dynasty. There'd always be someone sitting on David's throne. Clearly that's fulfilled in Jesus himself. 
Then we have a promise of a new creation. Isaiah 65, verse 17, Isaiah 66, verse uh, 22. And you think of the New Testament, right? In Christ, we are a new creation. We think of the end of Galatians, where the false teachers are saying, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the law to be saved. And what does Paul say at the end of the book? That uh, you have to walk, I'm paraphrasing this, you have to walk by the rule of the new creation. The problem with these false teachers is they're actually living in the old age, which where circumcision was required. But now the new creation has come in Jesus. And actually the letter starts that way, doesn't it? You know, have you ever wondered why the only letter where Paul begins by mentioning in the first verse Jesus' resurrection? Well, what's the resurrection signal? The resurrection is the sign of the new creation because Jesus' resurrection means the new creation has entered this present age. And of course, when we are resurrected, we will be, the new creation will be consummated for, for us. So there's, there's that promise of... Uh, of a new creation, and then there's a promise of a new exodus. So I'm not gonna pick up these texts, they're all over the prophets, especially if you haven't thought of this before, you probably all have, but if you haven't thought of this before, when you read Exodus 40 through 66, notice, it's actually earlier in, I said Exodus, when you read Isaiah 40 through 66, it's actually earlier in Isaiah 2, but notice again and again and again in those chapters, he talks about a new exodus. So this is a nice way, I think, to remember new covenant, new David, new creation, new exodus. What's, what's a new exodus? A new, new redemption, new freedom, because the first exodus is Israel's redemption. So wherever you see redemption in the New Testament, it has a typological relationship to Israel's exodus from Egypt, which, as Oren explained, right, that that's how you can preach. The Old Testament exodus, I mean, in a sense, God liberated Israel from Egypt. If you understand what I'm saying, like, who cares, right? <laughs> well, we do care because it points to that, that great exodus that's uh, taken place in Christ. So, New Covenant, New David, new creation, new exodus, all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So let's talk about just a few of the features of the new covenant. God gives us a renewed heart. And we, we saw that in that Jeremiah text, right? He takes out, or, or and then the Ezekiel text, right? He takes out that stony heart and gives us a heart of flesh. He gives us a desire to keep God's law, doesn't he? More, more on that. And then, then the other thing, so we have uh, a renewal of heart, or another way of really saying the same thing. We have a regenerate covenant people. So that's very, very important. Uh, I, if you're not a Baptist here, we love you. But this is, this is a very Baptist point. It's, it's a very biblical point, right? So anyway, we believe that everyone who's truly a member of the new covenant is regenerate. That's what Jeremiah says. You don't have to teach your neighbor. Know the Lord. We all know him, right? That's, that's the genius of the new covenant. That, that is why we at our church, and I know maybe all your churches do that, we interview everyone, two elders, we interview everyone who comes through for membership to try to discern, of course we can make mistakes, right? But we try to discern, are you really converted? Do you really know the Lord? That's why we don't baptize infants, because infants don't have that new heart yet. We pray they will, but we differ from Pres Presbyterians in this way because they're, they're allowing people into the covenant communi community that don't have a new heart. But this text says that that's the old covenant, right? The old covenant was a mixed covenant with some who were regenerate and some who were unregenerate, but that's not true of uh, the new covenant. Everyone who's a member of the new covenant 
community has that regenerate heart. Of course, you know, Presbyterians object, but you let some people in who aren't saved, right? But not intentionally. <laughs> That's the difference. You, you, you do it on purpose, you know? We don't do it that way. We, we love you, but... That's not the way it's done. What does 1 John say? He says, you, 1 John 2.20, you've been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. That's what he's talking about there. You, you, you know, 1 John is written to assure the readers of their salvation. And he's saying, you know, you know these things. You're, you're New Covenant Christians. You've been anointed by the Spirit and with the Word. Or as Isaiah 54.13 says, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. That's a new covenant promise, right? That's not a, that isn't a promise. At least I wouldn't, I don't think that's a promise all our kids will be saved. No, that's a, because I don't think there's a promise that all our kids will receive the new covenant blessing. Of course, we pray they will, don't we, earnestly. And we are optimistic that the Lord will bless his word. So in the Old Testament, the Spirit is poured out on prophets, kings, and leaders. But in the New Testament, every covenant member knows the Lord. And then I already mentioned this, but complete, definitive, final forgiveness of sins in the sacrifice of Christ. You know, Hebrews picks up on this, doesn't it? Hebrews loves the word better. Um, it, I'm just going to recite these verses. We have a better hope. 7, 7, 19, a better covenant, 7, 22, and 8, 6. Talking, that's in contrast to the old covenant. We have better promises, 8, 6. Right? Spirit is given to us, better sacrifices. Really, he says sacrifices, but really in the context, better sacrifice, right? The, the one definitive final sacrifice of Christ. He doesn't have to do it again, as Hebrews says, the sacrifices keep being repeated. Why are they repeated in the Old Covenant? Because they're not effective. But we have one final, effective, definitive sacrifice. We have a better, a better possession, a better inheritance, right? Not, not, just, not just the physical land of promise, not just Canaan, but the, but the new creation that's coming, which Oren Martin wrote a book on this. I think he brought 50 of them. And uh, I'm just kidding, he didn't bring 50. I don't think he brought any. But anyway, you can buy his book. You, you can, is his book here for sale? I don't know. It's not, it's not, it's not for sale, but you, you, can, you can still buy it. And um, the Martin family would be very grateful. So, so uh, really the same, the same thing, right? There's a better country. The, uh, that's really the same new creation promise, 1116. There's a better resurrection and there's a better word, um, Hebrews 12, uh, 24. We read in Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sacrificed. I mean, those who are being sanctified. One definitive <laughs> final sacrifice. So I have some other texts here, but we must move on. Then, then the other thing I'd want to say is the, the people of God are unified together. To, again, I don't have time to look at this in detail, but read Ezekiel 37, right? Do you remember that chapter? That's the dry bones chapter. And Judah, Ju the northern and southern kingdom are brought together there, right? They're going to become one stick, he says. And I, I believe that prophecy is fulfilled uh, first when, um, when Philip goes to Samaria in Acts. I think the author of Acts is thinking of, of uh, Luke is thinking of this Ezekiel 37 promise and the Samaritans, Samaritans are folded in. They're folded in with um, the Jewish believers, right? The, the apostles, which is why I think Peter and John, right? Philip is one of the seven, can't give them the spirit. Do you remember that? I mean, that's weird. Um, they have to come under the apostles. One unified people of God, and of course that includes us now, who believe in Jesus Christ as Gentiles. So just quickly, lessons learned from the new covenant. All the covenants are fulfilled in Jesus, right? He's, he's the last Adam. The world is preserved for his sake. He's the true and only son of Abraham. 
I mean, Paul tells us that in Galatians 3.16. He's the, he's the only obedient son. Remember that theme of obedience? He's the only one who always did God's will. Despite the remarkable life of Abraham and David, as, as we've seen, as, as Oren pointed out, they failed. He, he's the true son of David. Second, the, the covenant with Abraham is fulfilled in the new covenant. I already said this, right? Jesus is the true offspring of Abraham, Galatians 3.16. The land promise, the new heavens and new earth, that's the land promise. Finally, the new heavens and new earth, this creation, this world transformed, that's fulfilled in Jesus. The blessing, the universal blessing for Jew and Gentile all over the world, that's fulfilled in Jesus. It's being fulfilled right now. There's more work to do. It's already been fulfilled, right? And it's being fulfilled even more. Third, we learn from the new covenant that only God, the Holy Spirit, can transform our hearts. I mean, that's a, that's a huge part of the biblical story, isn't it? We've seen the, the depth of human evil. We've seen how much we need, we need the Holy Spirit to change us. Fourth, the new covenant teaches us that the sacrifices of the Old Testament are fulfilled in the sacrifice of Christ. And he inaugurated the new covenant with his blood. I already talked about that, really. Fifth, the purpose of the new covenant, and Oren talked about this so eloquently and beautifully, is to bring God's presence to us. So we'd have fellowship with God. So we would, so we would meet Jesus Christ. Sixth, I already said this as well, the new covenant is tied up with the, the new exodus, the new creation, and the new David. And seventh, the New Covenant community is a regenerate community. So, due to my lack of organization, now I'm starting my second topic. <laughs> so, but it's related to the first. So now I'm going to talk about the law a little bit. And Oren told me I can take all his time. No, he didn't say that. So here we go. The law. The, the word law, Torah, means instruction, but it also often refers to the commands found in the Mosaic Covenant. So I'm talking about those commands in that law today. What do we say about the law? First, the law, I, I really said this last time, last hour, the law is given in the context of the covenant, right? I'll carry you on eagle's wings. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. So the law, the law was not given so that Israel would merit a place with God, uh, in God's presence. That's not why the law was initially given. The ten words of the law, the ten commandments. So we don't have time to talk about each of the ten commandments, but I would want to say the first commandment is the fundamental teaching of the Bible. It's another way of saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Uh, the first commandment is God is to be first in our lives. He is to be supreme in our lives. Not our families, not our children, right? I've heard people say, well, if my family's not saved, I can't trust God. Well. That's idolatry, right? We love our families. We're, we are to love our families. God's first, not our families. God, 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 God you know, that's part of the test for Abraham. Who's first? Isaac? No, no, Isaac's not first. God's first. And the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment is really another way of saying the first commandment, right? You shall not covet because whatever you desire most, that's your God. And sometimes I've heard people say, oh, the problem with the Old Testament commandments is they never speak to the heart, but just outward activity. Really? Did you never read the 10th commandment? It says don't covet. That's desire. That speaks to the heart. And actually the way they're put together, therefore the 10th commandment informs all the other commandments. When Jesus is saying, right, don't, Lusting is a sin. Well, he's just reading the commandment. You shall not commit adultery through the 10th commandment, right? It's right there. So and another way to put it is 
So the first and 10th commandment, whenever we read all the commandments, we read them through that lens, right? If whatever we want to steal, that's our God, right? So, or we're coveting, right? The, 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 uh, the first and 10th commandment inform all the other commandments. Or another way to put it is, all the commandments are called to trust God at the end of the day. They're all, they're, they're all an invitation to say, what are you putting your trust in? Are you putting your trust in, in money, in getting your own way, in sex, so forth and so on? The law is a gift. It's a gift. I, this is Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. Look, I've taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God has commanded me, this is Moses speaking, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to possess. Carefully follow them, for this will show you your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples. When they hear about all these statutes, they will say, this great nation is indeed a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call to him? And what great nation has righteous statutes and ordinances like this entire law I set before you today. What a gift, Moses is saying, that God has revealed to you what you need to do. What a gift that is. What love that is to declare to you from the most high God what God wants us to do. And then you know this very well. I won't read all of these. The law of the Lord is perfect, right? Renewing one soul. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. So the law is a gift, isn't it? It's a beautiful gift. But, and I'm, there's an overlap here, but there's a problem. And the problem is a text I quoted last hour, Deuteronomy 29.4. Yet to this day, key text, right? Yet to this day, Deuteronomy 29.4, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind to understand, eyes to see or ears to hear. So God's given you the law, but he hasn't given you a new heart. Now, you, you can never read a verse like that and say, well, it's God's fault, <laughs> right? We, we, we are, that is not the intention of the text. God is the one who gives us a new heart, but it's our fault if we disobey. Here's my theology of divine sovereignty in one sentence, right? And I think it's biblical. It bothers some people. All sin, maybe it's two sentences, all sin is our fault. All goodness is to God's credit. There it is. That's what the Bible says again and again. And it doesn't fully answer that question, although things can be said. So, you know, we, we go back to all of Israel's history. Things seem to be going good under Joshua, but then comes Judges. Things seem to be going good under Solomon, but then come the kings. And then it ends up with exile. What's the fundamental problem with the Pharisees? If I were to ask that question, so many people say, well, the fundamental problem with the Pharisees is they're legalistic. But that's not what Jesus says. I think they were legalistic, but that's not their fundamental problem. What's their fundamental problem? What does Jesus say again and again? He says to them, do what the Pharisees tell you, Matthew 23, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. The fundamental problem with the Pharisees was not legalism, it's disobedience. That's what Jesus says. That's always the fundamental problem. Then legalism comes in and says, well, I can build a ladder. But, I mean, it's like an illusion, right? You, you're disobeying and then you think you're good. But they weren't good. They were disobedient. And that's what Romans says. You all know this very well, right? I was in high school, I was converted in high school, I was converted through my wife, a long time ago, very long time ago. Uh, and we, we had a, this, this is 1970s, it was a really weird time, you know, I don't know what's, I don't know what's going on in schools anymore, but 
there were the Jesus people in school. I was maybe I was one of them, whatever. Um, but you know, we had a class. I had a world religions class, and it said all 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 people seek God. They handed it out, and I raised my hand. I had my Bible with me, and I read Romans three. <laughs> But I'm sure he thought I was a weirdo. I, I, I probably am a weirdo. Um, but there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good. There's not even one. Not even Gandhi, right? <laughs> Nobody. There's no one out there. So, that, so the law is good, right? The problem is we're not. So that, that, that's the biblical teaching. The law, the, the law is a gift. The problem is human sin, you all know this, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Galatians 3.10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, then he quotes Deuteronomy 27.26, because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. You got to do everything. That's what it says, right? You got to do everything in the book of the law. Nobody does that, right? Um, Paul doesn't even say here nobody does it because the Old Testament tells us that again and again. James says the same thing. Forever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. You know, James uses the example, doesn't he, of the person who's committed murder but hasn't committed adultery. But how would that go in a court case? You've committed murder and you say to the jury, I just want to say something to the jury. By the way, I want you all to know I've never committed adultery. And they're like, who cares? <laughs> who cares? You committed murder. You're guilty, right? James says, James 3, 2, for we all stumble. And he, by stumble, he means sin there. That word means sin. It's the same word he uses actually in James 2. Patio is the Greek word. For we all stumble in many ways. How we all stumble in a few ways? He's talking about Christians there, right? Actually, he includes himself, doesn't he? We all, we all stumble in many ways. Now, he's not excusing it, right? I think it's the same James that just said we're justified by works. Good evidence, by the way, that the works can't be perfect, right? Very next chapter, he says we all sin in many ways. And yet, there's a sense in which we're justified by works. Well, that the works can't be the basis of our righteousness if we all stumble in many ways. So, so we need a new covenant, right? That, 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 so, you know, God's law is good. It was given in the context of grace. The problem is human sin. So we, and that's what we just talked about, the new covenant, where God writes the law in our heart, forgives our sins in Christ, gives us the spirit, and then we can walk and we can walk in his ways uh, by, by the power of the Spirit. And so then, then we're not surprised that justification is by faith, right? So let's read Galatians 3, 1 through 5. This is written to people who have already become Christians. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So I think that verse is most interesting, is it not? Because those of us who are Christians can be bewitched. A spell can be cast over us, so to speak, right? Probably satanic deception can take place, even in the lives of believers, because these believers were beginning, and we're all wired this way, I'm wired this way, we want to, even after we're Christians, we want to return to works as the basis of our right standing with God because we want to feel better about ourselves. It's just part of us. So he says, you become foolish. You're starting to listen to the wrong message. So he says, I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? And the answer is easy, right? Of course they know that. You know that. Of course you didn't receive the Spirit by the, doing the works of the law. What are the works of the law? Right, The works of the law is doing everything required in the law. Did you receive the Spirit by that? No, because you disobeyed. You, you received the Spirit by faith. Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing or being perfected or being completed 
by the flesh. That's crazy, isn't it? To turn to the flesh. Did you experience so much for nothing? If in fact it was for nothing. So then does God give you the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or is it by believing what you heard? So the New Testament reminds us, of course, it's in the Old Testament too. Abraham was righteous by faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's the very next verse here, right, in this section. But we're reminded again and again that, that justification comes by, by faith. He, uh, so the, I, I often tell this story of a Dr. Krauss. Dr. Krauss was a convert on, in Luther's day, and Dr. Krauss, sadly, tragically, I mean, I don't know, but I, I, even though I tell this story, I think there's a good chance that Dr. Krauss is in heaven. Well, who knows, at the end of the day, I can hardly say. I didn't know him, obviously. But Dr. Krauss ended up committing suicide. And the reason he committed suicide, he had a great struggle of conscience. We feel sympathy with him because he began to think that Christ was accusing him before the Father for his sin. So, that, you know, that torments your mind, right? He began to think in his head, isn't that what Paul's saying in this paragraph? Don't start believing the wrong message. See, that's what he says. What are you listening to, right? You're listening to the wrong message, and you start listening to the wrong message, and then it affects what you do, right? That's very practical. That's why biblical truth matters, because what you believe in your head, ultimately you'll do, right? So he started believing in his head, Christ is accusing me. Well, I mean, we understand it. He killed himself. He's like, I can't live with that. Right, but Luther said after he died, that's not the gospel. We never read Jesus accuses us. He's interceding for us, right? He's taken our sin upon us. We don't, but what, what was Krauss falling into? We all fall into it to some extent, right? That's why I say he could be, you know, it could have been a temporary defeat in his life and he still belonged to God. But what was the, he was starting to trust in himself, really, right? Because if you're saying he's accusing you, you're really, it's really a very subtle way of starting to trust in yourself. That's, that's not the gospel, right? The gospel is to trust in what Christ, Christ has done. We conclude, Romans 3, 28, that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And that's where Luther got by faith alone. One of the most famous Roman Catholic commentators today, Joseph Fitzmaier, I don't know if Joseph Fitzmaier is still alive. Last time I saw him, he was almost 90 years old, but he's lived a long time. But Joseph Fitzmaier in his commentary on Romans says, Luther was right. That does mean faith alone. Now, you know, I don't know what Joseph Fitzmaier believes about his whole life, right? I don't know him personally, but uh, there's a lot of Roman Catholic commentators who agree on that verse. A lot of them. I just mentioned one. So, uh, it, we're justified by faith alone, not by works. And then Romans 4, 1 through 5. What then, what then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. I think Paul means exactly what he says. If Abraham was justified by what he did, he could say, I did it. And God would say, great job, Abraham. But not before God, which I think Paul is saying Abraham was a sinner. And, and Oren talked about today how he's a sinner. For what does scripture say? Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. This is a problem with the new perspective, right? They think, they think there's no polemic against legalism, but this, isn't this what legalism is? You work, you get the check, right? Or deposit. People don't get checks anymore, much anymore, do they? It's a new day. But you work, you get the pay. Um, so, yeah, that's true. The problem is we don't do the work, right? If we did the work, that'd be fine. But to the one who does not work, and that's all of us, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. And I think by the ungodly there, because he's talking about Abraham, he includes Abraham. Abraham came from a family of idolaters, Joshua 24, 2. 
Look at that verse. I don't have time to look at it. He's, a, he's from an idolatrous family. So, so justification can't come from the law. The justification is by faith. That is the glorious truth of our faith, and that is so comforting. You know, I was raised as a Catholic. So I never heard that. It's not like I was seeking God. I wasn't. But when I heard that, that was like the best news in the world. And I was astounded, you know. I was astounded that the Bible says, the Bible says, you're justified not by works, but by faith. You know, I never, I never, ever imagined that. I, I, like I said, I wasn't seeking God. But every once in a while, I'd wonder, am I going to heaven? And I'd think, huh, I wonder if I'm 51% good. I, that's what would always go through my mind. And I'd think, I think I probably am, probably a little more good than bad. And then I'd think, but maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not 51% good. And then I'd, then I'd say, oh, let's go play basketball. <laughs> so, and honestly, I wouldn't think about it for a year. So it wouldn't come into my mind. It's not like I was, I was no Martin Luther, right? But so, so. So we're not justified by faith, but should we keep should we keep the law to be saved? And uh, Paul Paul says no. Circumcision circumcision is not required for salvation. Right? You're saved by faith, not by works. But then, so I'm going a little fast here, uh, but uh, we can talk about this in the question time if you want to. Why doesn't Paul say, sure, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved, but you should be circumcised anyway? Because that's what the Bible says. And that is what the Bible says, right? Genesis 17. The Bible's really clear. You must be circumcised in your flesh. It's an everlasting covenant. Now, how did he get around that, right? I think that's what the false teacher said. What does the Bible say, Galatians? It says... Be circumcised in your flesh. It's an everlasting covenant to belong to God. And it says in the flesh. It's not just spiritual. So how can Paul say you don't have to do that anymore? And I think Paul's argument is we're not under that covenant anymore. That covenant has passed away. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read kind of a long passage. And then from Galatians 3.15 to 4.7. Because I think this is a very important text on, on this issue. Well, maybe I won't read every verse. We'll see. Brothers and sisters, I'm using a human illustration. This is Galatians 3.15. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. Or that could be translated covenant. The translations differ. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. So that's the Abrahamic covenant, right? He does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed who is Christ. That's the great verse that says Christ is fulfilling the promise to Abraham. My point is this. The law, this is the Mosaic covenant now, the covenant made with Israel at Sinai. The law, which came 430 years later, later than the covenant with Abraham, does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. So the law covenant cannot invalidate the covenant made with Abraham. For the, if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise. Because then it's based on human performance, right? But God has graciously given to Abraham through the promise. So clearly, I think he's saying there the law is not permanent. Why? Uh, well, let's see, I lost it in there, here it is. Why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. So why was the law given? To multiply sin until, until the seed would come, Christ, right? But that's what he says in Romans 5.20, right? The law was given that the transgression might increase. That's the most radical thing Paul as a Jew maybe ever said. Because the, the, the Jewish view was the more law, I'm quoting rabbinic sources, the more law, the more life. What's the way to life? Law. That, that's, that's, our, that's the solution to the problem. Paul says it's not the solution. The law is not the solution to the problem. It's part of the problem, even though the law is good, right? 
The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator, Moses. Now, a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Because that law covenant is of a different nature and it's temporary. Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, if the law could be a source of life, if the law could change us, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. If people could keep the law, then righteousness would be based on the law, of course. But scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith come came, before this faith in Christ came, there was faith before, but this is faith in Christ, right? Before this faith, this faith in Christ came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ. But now that Christ has come, we're not under the law anymore, right? It was our guardian, it was our the, the Greek word is a pedagogos. We have our word pedagogue that comes from that. But I think the best translation is actually the law was our babysitter. You only need a babysitter until you're what? Whatever age that is, right? So that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a garden. We're no longer under the babysitter. We're not on, under the pedagogue. We're not under the law anymore. Chapter 4, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, instead he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. He's thinking of the law here. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion or fullness, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. We're no longer under the elements. We're no longer under the law. We're no longer under the guardian. Romans 6, 14 and 15, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Romans 7, 4 through 6, 2 Corinthians 3, I'm not going to read all these texts. The law, the law covenant has come to, to an end. So what do we say? The, 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 the law covenant wasn't a bad covenant, but we're not under that covenant anymore. A new covenant has come, Hebrews, right? We're under a new covenant now. The law, so the law and all the stipulations of that covenant has passed away. So I don't agree with those who say, now, now listen to me really carefully, I don't agree with those who say Paul's arguing directly that the ceremonial and civil law passed away, but not the moral law. Actually, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Actually, theologically, at the end of the day, I agree with that. But this is we have to be precise here. I think there's a lot of truth in that theologically. But I think they're getting to it the wrong way. Instead, I think what Paul says, you're not under any part of the law. That covenant is over. The Sabbath was the sign of that covenant which is one of the reasons I'm not a Sabbatarian, by the way, because uh, I don't think Sunday is the Sabbath, and I don't think the early Christians kept a Sabbath. The early Christians had to work on Sunday, by the way. The Romans didn't say, oh, you're Christians, and you want to worship on Sunday. Fine, take Sunday off, you know? And it wasn't like that. They met early in the morning or late at night because they had to work. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a great... We ought to prioritize our lives so we're there for worship, right? Of course, of course, I believe that. But I'm just saying, Sunday's, Sunday's not the Sabbath. Ignatius, very early after the, old, after the New Testament, writing about 110, said, we worship on the Lord's Day, not the Sabbath, right? So, you know, it became a slow tradition that Sunday was the Sabbath, but we're not under the Sabbath command. We're not under any of the commands. So, so... So, but yet yeah, it's paradoxical, isn't it? Because the law, the law is still fulfilled. So now the New Testament uses this language as well. The law is fulfilled by the power of the Spirit. Paul can say, Jesus died, the Spirit was given, Romans 8, 4, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us. 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But I thought we weren't under the law. <laughs> what do you mean the law, the requirement of the law is fulfilled in us? Now that seems almost contradictory, right? Or, or, or Paul says in Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love, love your neighbor as yourself, right? What, what, what do you mean the whole law is fulfilled? Or Romans, Romans 13, 8 through 10. Do not know, owe anyone anything. Um, I think some people, I don't think that means you can't have a mortgage on your house. I don't know if you've ever heard that view, but some people, I think, misinterpret what Paul's saying there. Um, do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then he gives specific commandments. The commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. What in the world is he talking about? I thought we weren't under the law. Now why is he citing certain commandments of the law? That's weird, right? What, what, is, what is going on? Is Paul contradictory? Or how do we put it? All together. And I would say, not just me, lots of people say this. No, these commands are not authoritative because they're part of the Mosaic Covenant. Of course, everything in the Mosaic Covenant is the Word of God, right? It's all the Word of God. But these things are still authoritative for us because they're part of the law of Christ. That's sometimes called a new covenant view, a progressive covenantal view. That's the view I hold. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So I think that's related to Galatians 5, 14. The whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ is love one another. No one loved one's neighbor like Jesus, right? So, um, yes, s some commands, even in the Mosaic Covenant, describe the law of Christ. Why, why are those commands authoritative? Why is it authoritative to say, don't commit adultery, Romans 13, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet? They're not authoritative because they're part of the Mosaic Covenant. They're authoritative because they're part of the law of Christ. Do you want, if we want to go the simplest way possible, how do we know they're part of the law of Christ? Because the New Testament says they are, right? And then I think actually if we back out, we can say, yeah, they're, they're authoritative because they represent, so that's, that's, I back in the other way, they represent moral norms. They're absolute moral norms. That's why they're authoritative. And, and then if we keep going theologically, why are they absolute moral norms? Because they express the very character of who God is. That's why they're authoritative at the end of the day. So, you know, a new covenant person, a covenantal person, we're really, really, really close, right? There's a difference there. The big difference is going to show up on the Sabbath. That's where it's going to show up, right? On everything else, we're just going to agree, right? We're, we're going to be... We're going to be in, in lockstep. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jews I became like a Jew. This is his mission strategy. To win the Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. I mean, isn't it fascinating? Paul, Paul, Paul is a Jew. To the Jews I became like a Jew. Wait a minute, you are a Jew. But that's not his fundamental identity anymore. Isn't that interesting in this world that talks about identity? Paul's not like, I'm a Jew, right? No, he, fundamentally he's a Christian. His fundamental identity isn't his ethnic background anymore. I think that's fascinating and illuminating. Anyway, to those under the law, I'm like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. Notice what he says, when I'm with the Jews, I do what they do, but I don't have to. <laughs> but I will, but I'm not under that law anymore. To those who are without the law, the Gentiles, like one without the law, though I'm not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. Isn't that interesting? To win those without the law. Yeah, so there, is, there are moral norms, Paul says. Circumcision doesn't matter, 1 Corinthians 7, 19. And uncircumcision doesn't matter. Keeping God's commands is what matters. 
So, you know, when we think of the commands, back to Romans 13, what is it? We, we do need commands, right? Because commands tell us what love looks like. People can be very sentimental. I remember reading Sheldon Van Auken's book years ago, and he was talking about people who commit adultery. And you know what they, they usually say? I was in love. I mean, the love was so powerful. Just had to. And what does God's word say? You weren't in love, right? That's not love. So, so the commands, the commands, the commands uh, save us from sentimentality, don't they? From false notions of love. Oh, I was so much in love, I married a non-Christian, right? Or, or whatever. I was so much in love, it was okay if we slept together before we're married. Whatever excuses people make, right? For uh, this is loving. And our culture is, you know, ter terribly confused on this. I mean, Christians are e even get confused about this, so non-Christians are very confused about it. So I, the commands, I, I like to, love is like a flowing, rushing river in all its power and all its beauty, right? And the commands are like the banks of the river that help us, keep us from false views of love. But love is much more than keeping commands. I, let's take an example. How many of us have been tempted today to murder another person? Don't raise your hand. Um, so I doubt, any, I, I doubt anybody in here is tempted to do that. But you could be really unloving today, right? You may not be tempted to commit adultery today, but you could still be mean to your spouse, right? So love is much more than just keeping these commands, but it's never less than that, right? It's more than that, but it's not less than that. That's why Paul focuses on love, because most of what it means to walk in a way that pleases God is not written down for us, is it? I mean, how could it be? Life is too complicated for that. So we have general principles, be gentle, be kind. But what does that look like? We need the Holy Spirit and wisdom to carry this out. So at the end of the day, he said, what matters is not whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Who cares about that, Paul says. I think it's even interesting. Paul didn't go on a campaign to say, what really matters in life is uncircumcision. Couldn't you see him going to that extreme after being in a big fight over circumcision? My big thing is uncircumcision. And he says, I don't care about that either. What I care about is keeping God's commands. And then he says, for in Christ Jesus, Galatians 5, 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith expressing itself through love. What matters isn't, aren't these things but trusting God. And then he says in Galatians 6, 15, for both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. So isn't that, there, there it is, well, the new creation has come. So with the new creation is what? The Holy Spirit. Because we can't, we can't keep these commands apart from God's power. Why? We, we need the Holy Spirit to, to do this. And that's, that's how we finally please God. And that's the gift of the new covenant, isn't it? The gift of the new covenant. So we, I think we should be fundamentally optimistic, right? We, we don't live perfect lives, but the Spirit empowers us to live in a way that is uh, pleasing to God. So I really like what Francis Schaeffer says in his book, True Spirituality. We live by the power of God, by the power of the Spirit. We live lives that are substantially, significantly, and observably pleasing to God. I love that. Not, not perfectly, but substantially. And that's my experience being around a lot of Christians, right? They live substantially in a way pleasing to God, significantly, observably. I can see it, but not perfectly. But there's still, there's still a big difference in how we live by, by God's grace. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We, we do pray for understanding, but most of all, Lord, we want to live according to what uh, your word says, and, and we want to live in the power of the Spirit. So, Lord, we just pray that as we read in Galatians that we would walk in the Spirit, that we'd be led by the Spirit, that we'd produce the fruit of the Spirit, that we'd march and step with the Spirit, 
Lord, that we'd sow to the Spirit and that we'd be filled with the Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.